Hello, everybody, and happy International Women's Day to all of you. Welcome to this IDF webinar on women in dairy, inspiring inclusion. This is the third year that IDF has organized a, web a webinar to share and promote stories from within and outside our sector, which really show how women and girls can and should be valued and included. I'm Dr. Judith Bryans, CEO of Dairy UK. I'm former president of the IDF and currently co-chair of the IDF Task Force on Women and Dairy. And it's my absolute pleasure to be your moderator today and to see so many of you on this webinar. And hopefully if you enjoy it, which I'm absolutely sure you will, or you will Please share it afterwards so that more people can hear the talks uh, from today. So I have, before I start introducing our speakers, I have a few housekeeping areas to cover for you. Firstly, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available after the webinar. As I said, please share it. Secondly, can I ask you to kindly mute your microphone and turn off your camera? Now, at the end of the webinar, I will ask you to turn your camera back on again for a very special uh, celebratory photo. But for now, if you could turn it off, we've got so many participants on the call that would really help us out. And lastly, for those of you who'd like to have a better understanding and follow better if you wish to do so, you're very welcome to use the transcript option and follow the subtitles from the webinar. So we actually have a fantastic program for you today. And one of the reasons I'm speaking so quickly is I'm very keen to get to the speakers and give you more time with them than listening to me. As you can see, we have really inspiring talks showcasing the role of women in dairy actually given by some very inspiring women. So our lineup of speakers, uh, as you can see on the screen there, is uh, we'll start off with Linda MacDonald. And I'm really happy to introduce Linda. She's project manager for dairy development at Tetra Pak's International Food for Development. She's also my fellow co-chair on the task force for women in dairy at the IDF. And she's an all round great person. So I'm delighted to hand over to Linda for her opening remarks. Thank you, Judith. What a wonderful welcome. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, advocates for change. Thank you for being with us today on this special March the 8th, International Women's Day. And as Judith said, as the co-chair of the Women in Dairy Task Force, uh, Judith will be moder moderating the session today and our tireless leader, Caroline Emont, the Director General of the IDF, it is our absolute pleasure to welcome you to our third International Women's Day webinar, where we're going to discuss how the dairy sector continues to enable the inclusion of women. So I am Linda McDonald, of course, and I work for Tetra Pak Food for Development, but I'm also the elected farm management representative for the IDF Science and Programme Coordinating Committee. I've actually been working for nearly 25 years in the dairy industry as a senior leader and project manager throughout the world, working through all food producing continents and supporting the dairy value chain in the industry. And that's given me an incredibly valuable insight and global experience that I'm so grateful for. And all of that experience came from the vibrant opportunities and possibilities that exist within our dairy sector. All of us here today believe that working towards the sustainable and equitable development of global food production um, is, is important and one of the most important things we can strive for. But this is simply not possible without the empowerment of women throughout the dairy industry. So within the IDF global community, our commitment to empowering women aligns seamlessly with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Specifically SDG 5, which is centered on achieving gender equality and improve, empowering all women and girls. This finds resonance in the very fabric of the dairy sector's impact on women's lives. It's not just about the economic aspects, 
It's about all the roles that women can play in the intricate web of dairy production, from daily animal care to processing, retail, science and technology, governance, and of course, policy. For generations, the dairy industry has, more, has been more than just a source of sustenance. It's been a catalyst for positive change in families, in communities, in nations, and economic regions. Women are often the gatekeepers for farm records, animal health and welfare, labor and recruitment, HR standards, sales, technical support. Women are employed by and are leading companies in the dairy industry. Women are in both developing science and implementing science. Women are involved in developing and implementing policy. And all of us are impacted by the governing policies. During the recent World Dairy Summit in Chicago in October 2023, we held the inaugural Women in Dairy Roundtable, where, the key, where key stakeholders from across the world gathered to delve into the powerful intersection of women's empowerment, socioeconomic development, and the nutritional powerhouse that is the dairy sector to discuss how technology and innovation can further empower women. These were really far ranging discussions one fundamental that was highlighted was that before we can even begin to talk about women in leadership, we first have to ensure that we have basic human rights, such as having the, the right to open a bank account without a man's approval, or the right to own or inherit land. Once these fundamental rights are in place, then technology can make life easier. It might be a robotic vacuum cleaner or a dishwasher, enabling somebody like myself to save hours each week. Or it might be milking machinery systems more ergonomically designed for different sized people. Or it might be policy innovation at organizational level to move towards workplaces working more for women and therefore everyone. Access to finance and capital are crucial. Leadership and mentoring programs developed within the dairy sector were highlighted within the roundtable as key platforms for women's growth and development. During all of our previous webinars and discussions, technology and innovation have been highlighted as one of the key enablers for women. A rising tide raises all boats. The International Dairy Federation Women in Dairy Task Force has the potential to be a powerful force, filling the gap in facts and stories about the place of women in the dairy value chain. The IDF serves as a source of inspiration offering a global network to support and develop women's expertise and careers in science, agriculture, and the food sector. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome you again to the International Women's Day webinar. Thank you, Linda. That was a, that was a really great background and shows exactly why the work of this task force is so important to us all at, at IDF. And now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, who's Dr. Esther Ashandi. Um, and you, Esther, like all the other ladies, has an illustrious career, so I'm just going to give you the highlights. Esther holds a PhD in economics from the University of Dar es Salaam and has over 10 years of research experience in Eastern Africa covering agricultural value chains and technology, gender and consumer food preferences, and more recently, sexual and reproductive health and rights of vulnerable women and youth. Currently, Esther is a gender scientist at the International Livestock Research Institute, which you will probably know as ILRI, and her work at ILRI explores the role of different livestock species in endowing women with financial autonomy and how that autonomy contributes to women's empowerment. Her work spans a number of countries, but today she will be talking to us about the gender work of ILRI with specific regards to a nutrition campaign in Rwanda. So Esther, over to you. Esther, we can't hear you, you're on mute. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm delighted to be with us today. Um, sorry. Oh, okay, all right. So let me turn on my video. I hope you can see me now. Just uh, Yes, we can see you, Esther. All right, thank you very much. 
your your slides are still in in presenter mode. I don't know if you can change that, but if not, we can see them anyway. Okay, still in presenter mode. Can I just stop sharing and share again? Let me stop sharing and share again. Let's stop sharing. Is it any better now? We can we can see them. All right, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, what I'll present to you today is uh, really looking at the role of women and, uh, and also uh, the focus on a Rwanda nutrition study. So the role of women in agriculture and the outline of the presentation is uh, I'll present the role of women in agriculture, Iris gender work, and then this specific nutrition case study in Rwanda. So women mainly form the backbone of uh, agriculture within the developing context. And we see women contributing in a vast uh, the number of ways to crop production, to livestock management, fisheries and forestry, but also playing different roles. They play different roles as a, a, a formidable workplace that the agriculture sector relies on as both paid as, and unpaid labor, but then also they are highly represented amongst the unpaid labor. labor. They're also more likely to be employed in agriculture, is no aspect of agriculture, but also part-time agriculture work and paid or often paid much less than men. They play a variety of roles because women are not a homogeneous group, but rather a diverse uh, category of people. In agriculture, they also play a, a very important role, post-production and post the value chain when it comes to aspects of consumption they are a, a big uh, portion of what we can uh, classify as um, the market for agricultural commodities as consumers, but they also play an active role in processing and preparing food for co consumption, both commercially as well as within households. And they play another key important role, which is in managing food safety and food preparation, as well as managing food waste. We see women in their roles are however constrained by a number of issues. And some of those are structural, with the structural barriers coming out very strongly, especially when we look at policies, discriminatory uh, social and economic institutions, as well as their dampened um, aspirations. These structural barriers act at different levels within the local scale, at the community scale, at the higher level scale, where we now look at, at the national level, regional level, and even at the global level. And at the global level, there's also a number of uh, a number of limitations that they face. So, with regard to ILRI, what does uh, what's the goal of the ILRI gender team? ILRI, ILRI International Livestock Research Institute does focus on a different on a number of different aspects, but gender gender aspects also form a core as a core focus for the for the institution. So I'll present um, the, the gender team theory of change. In other words, what's our long-term goal? Our long-term goal at ILRI as the gender team is to achieve better livelihoods through gender inclusive, through gender inclusive, equitable, and socially sustainable livestock systems. And this is the longer-term vision. But in order to, to achieve the longer-term goals, uh, there are a number of issues that we have to address, especially behavior that we have to see change within the within the shorter term or within or a number of actors that we have to work with. And the kinds of actors that we work with to achieve the longer term vision are livestock value chain actors, mainly supporting women and youth involvement so that they can also benefit from livestock business. We additionally work with a large majority of people in livestock communities mainly so that they can adopt gender equitable behavior. And we also work with institutional enforcers, supporting them to come up with, with uh, more gender equitable laws, policies from both the village and uh, up to the national level. Now, uh, in order to, 
to see this change come to pass within the shorter term? What are our focus? Our focus is we work, we work on a number of outputs and these outputs come in the aspect of research. And in research, we explore livestock, uh, livestock and gender equity, looking at women's empowerment, youth empowerment. We also develop appropriate research tools we, we help technical teams within the institution and outside the institution to integrate a gender lens in, in their research. And then we also explore different areas of research as well as do fundraising for new studies. Apart from research, we move on to the area of research to scale. So how do we test our interventions to a larger scale? So we bridge the, the gap in research and development by working with different implementing partners, some of whom are um, non-government organization, some are pharma groups, collaborating with them in order to move our research from the textbook right into implementation. But apart from that, we do not do the research and sit on it ourselves. We also strive to do capacity development, building capacity of new researchers, but also of our research partners and our development partners. Then we work with policymakers, giving them evidence, but also supplying them with tools in order to shape what the, the policies that they come up with. But also they are, we, we engage with the policies I have, that they have in place, which also shape our research work. And then lastly, we do a high level engagement, which is where we share findings with various audiences, including the right for us, so that the messages that we, come, that we have from uh, our work do go out and help to change lives and, and help and improve lives, better lives through livestock. So the gender team at ILRI is, uh, these are some of the people, uh, we have a number of them spread across uh, the continent. Some are within Africa, some are within Asia, and they work on different aspects. We see, we see some working in animal health issues, environment issues, some working on, uh, some working on, some working, working on uh, field coordination, some are also students. Ilri is located in different uh, countries. We are located in Burkina Faso, Burundi, across, across the continent. We are also in Asia, in China, India, Nepal, but uh, the, host in, the, the host stations are in Ethiopia. Uh, Ilri is co-hosted by Ethiopia and, and Kenya. So we have staff spread across different regions. Now this is where we focus on the specific nutrition study in Rwanda. So for the nutrition study that we conducted in Rwanda, it was implemented within a, a, a bigger program, which is the Gaburama Tamuke uh, Social Behavior Change uh, Communication Intervention, which was being held in two specific districts, that's in Nyavihu and Ubango districts in Rwanda. These districts do experience or exhibit a high prevalence of child stunting, but also the level, there's a higher levels of poverty within these districts. They're mainly agricultural with beans, maize, sweet potatoes, as crops grown, but then there's small ruminants such as goats and goats within that within the districts, but there's also cattle as well as poultry kept within this district. Now, what we what we also notice within these districts is that uh, there's differentiation of gender roles. Men and women play complementary roles, but at the same time, their roles seem to be differentiated in a number of ways. For example, women are generally responsible for subsistence crop production, while men typically engage in cattle production. Women play key roles such as uh, paid laborers in fields, managing small livestock, seeking veterinary care. But they do this, they seek veterinary uh, care for, for livestock, mainly when their husbands are, are absent from the household or if they are single women. Men, on the other hand, play also roles such as milking the cattle, construction of cattle pens, looking for feeds, but they rarely am involved in cattle management, the day-to-day -day feeds, which is an activity commonly done by women. Rather, they engage more in milking and selling of milk products. The data that we collected was through focus group discussions and key informant interviews, and uh, the, the participants to these focus group discussions were purposely selected as to, target, to target those households which had children that were below 12 to 15 months and had recently received a call through the Gilingha program. The key informants who gave uh, specific information and were knowledgeable were also purposely selected from the community leaders, religious leaders, 
and agricultural or veterinary extension officers. So with the two districts that we targeted, we have Uhango, we have Nyavihu, and then we, we show here the number of focus group discussions. There were four focus group discussions for, for women and four focus discussion groups for men, as well as eight key informants with whom we interacted. Now I'll present the results. So for the results, we saw that the status of uh, animal source foods consumption. Animal source foods consumption, here I will refer to those foods that from, from which we can, we can, the foods that we can access from livestock, from, from animals such as cows, they, we pick the milk from poultry, we pick the eggs, we pick the, the, the chicken itself. And overall, we saw that animal source foods are rarely consumed. People mainly consume crop-based foods and buy the animal source foods whenever they have money. That's usually after the harvest or during festivities, as well as during different functions in the community, such as weddings. In some cases, milk is only provided to children when they are ill with the perception that if they consume milk, then their bodies will be able to fight off the diseases. However, there's an understanding, people exhibited an understanding of the importance of child nutrition to child health. There's a, a, this is something which is widespread with more and more people, mainly men and women, indicating that better health in children reduces severe forms of malnutrition like kwashiorkor, but then also again that children who are not well fed can become weak and feel stunted. Within the study sites, we also noted, noticed that men and women held perceptions about their gendered responsibilities with regard to food. Men's main responsibilities is that they would provide for their families. They are the primary caregivers for the family. So they give money to the women and then the women can buy food. Men also sometimes buy food, including animal source foods, but they only do this where women are limited in terms of mobility, such as if they have young children at home, they have to take care of and cannot go to the market. Men are the final decision makers on animal, food, so animal source foods purchase. They also make key decisions on allocating milk, whether for sale or for consumption in the household. Additionally, they play a key role in slaughter of small livestock, such as poultry. Women, on the other hand, supplement the food that the men provide. So they get they, they, they supplement that either by buying, buying food with additional income that they get, but then they also purchase food. That's, their, that's a key activity women perform and prepare food. They contribute to decision making. However, the final decision making on, on purchase of lives of animal source foods lies with the men. Women allocate food to different household members, and this is guided by the information they have from the nutrition trainings they get within their communities, as well as with existing gender norms with which they have uh, they have the gender norms that they have uh, internalized because they know that in the community to show respect, you have to allocate this portion to this household member. So that's a role of women. Women additionally uh, manage food hygiene. Noticeably though, both men and women play very different roles, although these roles come together and look more complementary. Men also play a key role when it comes to uh, the health of the household. We notice that uh, with regard to healthcare, men, uh, with regard to healthcare, there are a number of activities such as clinic, clinical services, antenatal and postnatal visits, child growth monitoring sessions, and uh, child healthcare, healthcare trainings. However, very few men personally participate in this. They support this by providing the result, the money to cover the cost of these activities, or they purchase health insurance to cover this, or they also provide money for transport. But very few men physically engage in this kind of activity. When it comes to domestic work, such as fetching firewood, care for children, cooking, very few women engage, very few men engage in such activities. Men only engage in such activities if their wives are not feeling well, or if their wives are, uh, are expecting children and at uh, the later stages of, of pregnancy. The other thing we saw is that domestic uh, animal source food, food related activities, men engage in some of this, such as through slaughter of small, of, uh, small stock like poultry, they milk cows, but they also support women in finding feeds for cows to boost production of milk. However, although men's, uh, men's engagement seems to be 
a little bit minimum, what we notice is that there's there are huge benefits to engaging men in animal source foods aspects for nutrition. Men's engagement in child nutrition is very critical. And it's critical because when we when children are not well fed, when children are poorly fed, some of the children drop out of school and migrate to bigger cities in order to find a livelihood. The other thing is that it's important to engage men because they usually supply, according to the local norms, they supply the money that's needed for purchase of, of, nut of nutritious food and they make the key decisions. Something else is that intra-household conflicts often are triggered by hunger. Therefore, it's important that men are constantly engaged so that this can be managed. Overall, in the community, there's a big link. When a, man, when a man's family is looked at, there's a link between how he's perceived in the community and how the health of his family, the nutrition status of his family looks. We saw a few potential barriers to men's engagement in animal source foods aspects for the family. One is meal preparation. With regard to meal preparation, men are usually absent from meal preparation because of existing gender norms that dictate meal preparation to be under the jurisdiction of the woman. Men also lack proper nutrition information because for a very long time, much of the nutrition information has been channeled through women and men have not been direct recipients. They therefore often lack this kind of nutrition. However, within the households, we saw that there's, 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 uh, there's instances or increase in instances of conflict over allocation of resources for nutrition because men opt to, to consume foods and, out, and animal source foods from outside the home or to spend their resources on, on alcohol which they spend outside the home while the household is in need of such foods. And sometimes as a strategy to come against this, women sell household property to cover for the, for the shortfall in order to buy food. And this causes conflict within the household. However, although we've seen some of the barriers, we also saw some of the enablers that the, that the focus group discussions and key informants highlighted. There are some enablers for men's engagement in order for the families to consume animal source foods. And many men, many women had the attitude that men should learn how to prepare healthy meals through attending cooking demonstrations. They should also get trained on food hygiene practices because men have a tendency of providing children with unboiled milk, which can be harmful to their health. They also, women also felt that, it, that there is need for men to attend children growth monitoring sessions so that they can understand the, the status of their children and see the need to spend money on, on the nutrition of their children. However, women also felt that there is need for men to discuss with them about the overall nutrition objective of their household so that they can be involved in such nutrition in such uh, decisions rather than acting as people who are just uh, only providing the labor for the household to cook food. Potential enablers on the men's side were also a number because men indicated that they, they indicated they are very interested in getting trainings from community health workers, from village elders, from church leaders on nutrition. And to the extent that they also said they were interested in having some trainings from their wives. Now, this is very important that they have they do have this kind of interest. Another thing they showed, they also showed that they showed interest in having printouts of charts, billboards, brochures, and posters with nutrition messages. If this can be illustrated even for men who are not educated so that they can access and interpret these messages, they showed that it would be very good for them. Men had also interest in accessing nutrition specific information via media such as radio and TV, especially if this can be channeled through, if this can be channeled at a time such as just after the news. And they showed, so this gives us opportunities for intervention. Now the discussion that we'll have will just be brief in the interest of time. We see that there's a lot of restrictive masculinities with regard to men, which affect nutrition interventions that even when there are interventions in place, the households may not necessarily benefit from consumption of animal source foods, whether as children or as expectant women or women themselves. Some of these uh, that we saw coming through dominantly were that men are breadwinners, that men should be financially dominant, that men should control household assets, have the final say in household decisions and not do unpaid care domestic work. 
In this case, we see that there is power, privilege, position for men. However, they still bear the responsibility of feeding their families well. Now, the conclusion of what we studied is that nutrition interventions need to take three key issues into consideration. Interventions need to address, to address nutrition behavior change. Interventions need to have a technical intervention in order to increase productivity of livestock. And then there's need for agenda transformative uh, interventions, which particularly target gender norms, restrictive gender norms, as well as target empowerment aspects. And we see that for with regard, especially to the technical intervention, the technical intervention would help communities to access sufficient, uh, sufficient output, sufficient output so that they have what they can consume and also what they can, what they can take to the market. Increasing productivity can avail households with sufficient output. The other thing is that there's need to access markets, there's need for market access, but with a, a caution to paying attention to male capture because when commodities become commercialized, men usually have a tendency, there's a tendency for men to take the front stage, but there's also need for food safety to be something that's taken into consideration. Then with regard to training men, as men are being trained, one of the things to give consideration is that there are norms such as men should not engage in reproductive, um, reproductive tasks like production of food. And with this, there are also men and women's spaces. There's need to consider this in the training, but there's also need to design appropriate training materials that, may, that can be sent out through the media. And the other thing is that trainings also should interrogate, this is now the gender transformative aspect, which is interrogate the, the, interrogate the inhibitions or the limitations around culture, interrogate cultural aspects around animal source foods uh, consumption, such as where community says, as a sign of respect, the men should be given more, as a sign of respect, the, the woman should be given less or a child should be given less. Such things need to be really interrogated. And then also bringing together spouses so they can discuss and resolve co conflicts within the household. Also within the transformative approaches is being aware of the potential of working, of the risk that arises when we work in male spaces, especially if we have to involve women as trainers. And then uh, of course, looking at gender equitable masculinities, how can we encourage equitable masculinities where men engage more, where, where men can support their families to, to consume animal source products, where men can support their wives, especially with domestic care work. So, I just give a highlight of some of the publications that we have from the gender team, some of our publications, such as those uh, that we have highlighted here. For this study, it's a study which, which, was, which is the second highlighted here uh, by Fanworth, Holverson, and the rest. This is Gender Roles and Masculinities in Leveraging Milk for Household Nutrition, Evidence from two districts in Granda. So they, we have a number of publications out. And with that, I would like to say, we can have better nutrition through engaging more with communities, adopting gender equitable, equitable approaches, engaging more with men, encouraging gender equitable masculinities. Thank you very much. Esther, thank you so much. It's absolutely fascinating to listen to and just such important work that you're doing there. And we really appreciate you being one of our speakers today. So thank you very much indeed. Our next speaker is Becky Rasdo, and Becky, Becky also, like all of the other ladies, has a great career. So I hope she won't mind if in the interest of time, I introduce her in, in her current role. So Becky is a Vice President Trade Policy and International Affairs at the International Dairy Foods Association and has been in that role since 2020. And Becky is also the uh, currently leads the IDFA's Women in Dairy Initiative and will be talking to us today about the role of women in dairy, the work of the IDFA. Over to you, Becky. Thank you, Judith. Um, can you see my screen share? Yes, we can see it. Is it sharing the right thing? I think is the better question. It's sharing the right thing. We can just see the slides. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, 
Well, I have to say now I have a little bit of imposter syndrome because I'm not a gender scientist. I don't have a PhD. Um, and until about a month ago, I didn't work on women's issues very much at all, um, as you could tell by my by my title that Judith just mentioned. But um, at, at any rate, I've had the opportunity through International Dairy Foods Association to um, work with our women in dairy network, and it's been extremely rewarding. Um, and so I just thought I would share some of that work with you today. Um, if you're not familiar with International Dairy Foods Association, we are an advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. We have a global membership of um, uh, member companies that range from, <clears throat> we always say it's from the time the milk leaves the farm. So as um, it can be co-ops, processors, retailers, um, the entire supply chain of dairy from the time it leaves the farm, primarily U.S. based, but worldwide members as well. Um, so we also have a Women in Dairy Network, as I mentioned, it's over 950 women strong. Um, uh, and it was initially created a couple of years ago to empower, encourage and support women. Um, and just in starting to work on it last year, uh, we kind of thought, you know, um, that's a wonderful mission, a very much needed mission. But I think if we're going to effectuate actual change in our sector uh, with the problems that some women seem to be experiencing, we need to have some data to support uh, what's going on. We need to benchmark ourselves. We need to um, see what we can discover based on actual uh, voices uh, through a survey. So we released um, in, in January, IDFA released its first ever State of Women in Dairy report. Uh, the report's on our website if you want to go check it out. It was based on a survey that we conducted from October 17th to November 7th, 2023, to establish gender equality benchmarking data for the U.S. dairy sector um, and develop recommendations for possible industry action. So our survey focused on three categories of questions, demographic data, experiential responses, and policy-based responses. The survey included both quantitative and qualitative responses, uh, excuse me, questions for those responses, with the latter focusing on perceptions, beliefs, and attitudes. Um, we also had some statements describing experiences working in the industry uh, that were taken directly from long answer responses submitted to the online survey. Um, so we tried to get both. Becky, sorry if I can interrupt you for a second. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I'm not seeing any slides going forward. Yeah, I just, I haven't, I, this is just <laughs> what the survey was. Sorry, I, I can move forward, um, but, um there we go so uh, um so we tried to do make sure that the sur um the survey included both uh excuse me the report of the survey included both qualitative data and quantitative or anecdotes um in it um so we i i just wanted to recap some of the findings and then we also had recommendations in the report we thought it was important to um make sure that we weren't just um, sharing the data out, but trying to do something with it. Um, so that's what the report is. So let's start with who we surveyed. The survey was conducted online, about 450, excuse me, 548 professionals across the dairy industry, 396 women and 152 men of varying ages, job lengths, um, job functions, length of experience in the global dairy industry, working for processors, farmer cooperatives, farms, retailers, and suppliers. Um, I was very, I do just want to say we um, provided a link to the survey at World Dairy Summit last fall. Um, we did get some global response and um, encouragingly, we got some male responses. Um, and I really, if any men listening or hear this participated, I really want to express appreciation for that because having both perspectives made it really helpful to understand, uh, the better understand the trends and dynamics of the questions we asked. Um, and we do intend to do it again in the future. So um, I, I think we, we would love to see additional um, demographics participating in the future. So digging into what we found, we tried to categorize our responses into six basic takeaways and then some recommendations, like I mentioned. So I'll just touch on a couple of the findings from each takeaway and then share the recommendations. I can, there we go. So the first takeaway um, that we had was uh, with respect to women's overall treatment in the industry. Um, so our full report says much more, but we thought there was a significant disparity between men's and women, women's responses on their treatment. So beyond the data you see here, others responded anecdotally. 
one person said, even though I am the most senior knowledgeable person in my organization for my issues, I find throughout my career, people have double checked with a man who I supervised or who is junior to me. I think people assume he has more experience or knowledge simply because he's male. Another uh, comment responded, uh, I often feel that I'm looked down on because of gender and age. Working alongside older men, it is thought that women should prepare meetings, dinner reservations, and get tedious work done because we are, quote, better planners. Um, so those are just a couple of the examples, but you can see the data on the screen. Another finding um, that we touched on, a key takeaway uh, that we tried to evaluate was gender pay equality. Um, interestingly, in this section of the report, we found that both women and men reported feeling that women are not perceived to provide the same value as men or that women must do more than their male counterparts before obtaining pay equality. Additionally, um, women indicated disproportionate challenges to obtaining promotions and supervisory positions, which are two actions that would of course begin to address pay equality. A few of the comments respondents offered on this topic were, um, for example, when I was offered a significant raise due to another offer, due to an offer in another company, the organization I was working for kind of fixed my male peers' salaries to level them up to my new salary. Before that, the organization did not have a problem with them being paid way more than me. Another person said about a year ago, I was asked for equitable, I asked for equitable compensation because I do the same job as the new men coming into our group and I have more experience but get paid less. I was told that's not how we determine pay. And I didn't know for sure I was being paid less. I just suspected it, but their response to my request made it clear. Um, so this is an area we feel we could improve on and I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, the third uh, key takeaway that we wanted to um, make sure we focused on were themes of mentorship, allyship and support. We were really pleased to see um, both the amount of support being received, but also how many respondents expressed the importance of support in their advancement. Um, anecdotal survey responses showed women value mentorship, sponsorship, and allyship. They show that women crave more organized and intentional opportunities to engage in mentorship, sponsorship, uh, or allyship relationships with both male and female executives. One respondent commented about the importance of that intentionality um, because intentional recruiting and mentoring women in the industry is really what's needed to make a difference from her perspective. And she indicated that she didn't believe that um, we'll really be able to move the needle and in increasing female presence in dairy leadership without it. The fourth um, of the six key findings that we wanted to touch on were just the opportunities that exist for women's advancement in the industry. I think it's really exciting to see that women express both a strong desire to be a senior leader in the sector, um, in some cases even more so than their male counterparts, but they also shared their views that, um, importantly, that gender impacts their ability to attain those leadership roles. So there's quite a bit of ambition there. Um, but they are uh, being hindered in, in obtaining their ambition. Anecdotal responses to um, outline reasons why women may feel limited in their advancement opportunities uh, within the US include um, one person who said, when I held roles of less responsibility, I didn't feel like gender was much of an issue, but when my roles and responsibilities increased, especially in the manufacturing space, I felt gender played a strong role. Other respondents did describe male perceptions about home duties and child rearing appearing to play a role in advancement and acceptance of women into leadership positions. She said, while I'm female, I don't have children, but I believe if I needed maternity leave or had more responsibilities at home, it would definitely limit my advancement opportunities. Um, the fifth key finding, if I can advance, there we go. Uh, that we wanted to touch on were the factors that impact women's retention and recruiting. Because we ultimately want to make sure the efforts of our women in dairy network at IDFA result in a sector where women feel welcome and are retained long term, we also asked about their desire to leave or stay in the sector and factors that impact that desire. And the results show this is an area we really need to work on to keep women in the sector. Um, 
you can see some of the data on the screen, but anecdotal survey responses suggest companies should strengthen programs that support the advancement, professional development, recruiting, and retention of women, and that there may be a connection between such programs and the overall sectoral retention of women. Um, some of the quotes that we received uh, included different from policies. Uh, there needs to be interactive forces that incur that um, that force the employee to look differently when it comes to the workforce. Um, we don't do anything in our company to set a baseline of the expectations for our teams, and we need a culture that creates that in the workforce. Um, another person said, one of the biggest excuses I hear about not having women in senior leadership roles at my company is that they aren't in the pipeline. So I don't think my organization supports retention and advancement of women. So just really making that translation from um, talking about it to doing it within companies is something that we um, thought was a finding worth touching on and something that we do want to see what we can do about. And I'll get to that in just one minute. Um, but first, the last finding from the report, uh, from the survey data. I can advance. There we go. Um, we did ask questions, I, I as I mentioned, on policy uh, based responses, uh, the efficacy of policies um, and their importance in the sector. We asked both about company level policies and equality goals, and then those um, established globally, such as by the United Nations. Two thirds of men reported that policies or procedures in place um, that prohibit discrimination on the basis of gender make a difference, but only 43% of women said the same. And even more women, Concerningly, about 58% of women said such policies either don't make a difference or they didn't know if they made a difference. Respondents reported that when an anti-discrimination policy was more effectively administered by leadership at the top throughout the organization and its workforce, treatment towards women improved. And it, so there's a strong linkage between active administration of policies and effectiveness. And in general, there was agreement that there's a relevance of written policies unless a company's culture is willing to adopt it. I'm not sure that any of us are really surprised by that. So um, just in looking at the time, I'll just uh, move forward. We we thought it would be disingenuous to say, uh, you know, the report outcomes and findings are all negative or, or bad. There are areas of strength. Um, the fact that these policies do exist is a strength. The fact that um, there was indication of flexibility and work schedules and opportunities for advancement do exist and that women do have that ambition to lead. Um, so I we really want to make sure we're um, covering not just the things that need to improve, but also the things that are going well. That being said, um, like I said, we really want to make sure this was something we could take action on that not just um, publish some data and walk away, but try to um, make recommendations to the companies uh, in the US at least, and um, see what we can do at IDFA at least to support it. So it might seem um, elementary, but uh, the first one is to make sure that you're not just having those policies, but actually have that company level culture of, of um, respect and, and inclusion. And that's just based on the feedback uh, received in the report, as I mentioned. Um, uh, the second one was to develop structured executive led programs that support leadership development. So what we've seen is um, we have we've seen companies that are doing this well, some aren't doing it at all, but of those that I identify that are implementing structured development programs, we hear that that simple act of creating transparency around how to get from one level to another, whether it's manager to executive or entry level to manager, what's needed how you do it, making sure it's part of a performance review discussion, giving the employee objectives to hit related to that advancement. All of these things kind of take the mystery away of, of how to advance, who makes it to the C-suite and all of those things. So we felt that was pretty important. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the finding on um, gender pay inequalities. A really simple way to address that would be to conduct annual compensation audits and uh, publish those findings with employees at least to talk about what you're doing to address the disparities. Uh, just three more uh, industry actions and a couple more points, Judith, and I promise I'm wrapping up. Um, we, again, it, it probably seems elementary, but we did have people respond to say that um, there wasn't a HR function at their company. Well, you know, if you're experiencing discrimination or you have a pay inequality or any of the things we've 
found in the findings, who do you go to if you don't have an HR function? So ensuring that companies have an, uh, a competent, adequately resourced function that does provide meaningful support is something that can absolutely be done. We had a lot of comments on um, family leave policies, not just for maternity leave, but paternity leave or dependent care leave. So um, making sure that family leave holistically is reviewed and, and considered as just as something you can do to um, help your employees feel uh, welcome and supported in the sector um, seemed like an easy lift for us um, to suggest. And then um, this is a, a recommended action we're taking on ourselves to continue the survey, improve on the survey and data. I think we need to do more with getting it frontline workers to get more male responses, to get more global responses, um, and continue the benchmarking, continue the exercise to see if we can actually move the needle on some of this data. The last thing I just say is uh, our, we have an annual conference um, at IDFA every January at which over a thousand dairy executives participate. Um, and I, I presented this report and its findings and had a panel discussion on it um, in January. Mm -hmm. And I think um, our panel consisted of a CEO, David Allum from Hillmar Cheese. Robin Kane is a chief HR officer with Aurora Organic Dairy. Um, and Annie Waring is a, is a rising next gen uh, leader, director of business development for Americold. So a variety of perspectives on that panel. And I found um, some of the highlights um, just helpful for us to take away today as kind of a final thought. Um, they said gender equality is a journey, not a destination. So um, may, helping us level set with that concept, I think is, is a good place to be. Um, making sure men are part of the conversation and the solution. Um, making sure that mentorship programs can be created and crafted innovatively. You can, uh, Robin had a great example of intergenerational pairing. Um, and these are how that's worked in other sectors, and we can uh, um, explore those opportunities in dairy. And um, really, David, as the CEO of Hillmar mentioned, he felt that gender equality was a business imperative for him and his business. And I just thought that was a great perspective to hear um, and for us to know that there are leaders out there viewing it that way. So this is a QR code I, I had it at uh, at at Dairy Forum um, for anyone who wanted to just give their feedback, their ideas, their thoughts on the report and the survey and how we can make it better or what I've missed. Uh, so I just left it in here. If anyone does want to um, take a picture of that and, and give us your feedback anonymously or otherwise, um, really more, more brains are better to make this a better initiative and, and we'll keep up the questions in the survey and keep it going. And uh, with any questions or concerns, I'm always available to, to hear from anyone. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Becky. And I must apologize. I hope I didn't put you off your stride earlier. I wasn't trying to oh, rush no. you. I have just presented merrily and not pushed my own slides along <laughs> in the past. I didn't want you to do the same. But that was uh, that was brilliant. And I have to say, you got some really raw and honest responses from uh, from those who responded. And that's that's fantastic. I I think, you know, it's uh, people must have felt very safe to answer the way that they answered. And although some of the finding, as you said, findings, as you said, might have been predictable, just seeing them all together was great and seeing the recommendations was great, um, too. So thank you very much indeed. Um, our last speaker is uh, Caroline Imond and Caroline will be known to if not everybody on the call, uh, the majority of the people on the call. So I'm not sure I can really do her justice in an introduction, but I'll do my best. Um, Caroline Imond was appointed as Director General of the IDF. Uh, and I know that well because I appointed her. So I'm absolutely um, delighted to be uh, introducing her today. Caroline's a lawyer. She's been a diplomat. She has over 25 years experience in senior executive roles across a range of sectors. And she's also been involved in government of, uh, in governance bodies such as on Gazel and Leap. So quite a career it wrapped up into a 10 second introduction, Caroline, but I know many people on this call know you very well. And today, Caroline is going to talk to us about women in dairy, the work of the IDF. Thanks, Caroline. 
Thank you so much, Judith. I couldn't find a better way to celebrate the International Women's Day than being with you today all and to be sharing the work we've been doing at IDF in the last year and what's actually coming in for this year. Uh, just before we start, just wanted to remind us of why it's important uh, to work on women in dairy. And there's a few reasons. The first one is that we've mentioned that earlier today, gender equality in women and girls in Parliament is essential to achieve all of the SDGs uh, and particularly the one uh, on gender equality. Milk and dairy food contribute to women's nutrition and empowerment. Uh, women contribute to the global dairy sector. Uh, and the IDF contribution to SDG 5 uh, will be actually helping to improve and empower women around the world. Uh, for those who have an interest uh, in the topic, I would recommend that you read the FAO report on the status of women in agri-food system. Uh, it actually states clearly how agriculture is important for women uh, and how women are important in agriculture. So I really encourage you to, to read into that. Um, I just want to say a few words on the mandate that we've given to a task force on women in dairy. And before I start, I want to thank Andy Novakovic that is on a call. I saw him earlier today. He's actually the first one who came with uh, to me on, with this idea uh, of working on women in dairy uh, in uh, in IDF. And I wanted to thank him for that because it's because of him we're all here. Uh, so thank you, Andy, for bringing that, uh, giving us the, 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 the fire we needed uh, to get it started. So thank you for that. So the role of the task force is really uh, to uh, enter the contribution of the global dairy sector to women's empowerment. Um, and there's a place definitely for IDF to fill the gap on the facts um, that are actually uh, missing on the place of women in all aspects of the dairy chain. Um, and also uh, IDF is a source of inspiration and role models. That's what we've given ourselves as, as, as an objective uh, for the contribution of women into science, agriculture and food. Uh, and IDF offers to women a wide and rich uh, wild, uh, worldwide network and support uh, in development of their expertise and their career. So those are the objectives we have with our task force. So far, we've achieved already a lot. We're very proud of what we've done. Activities in 2023, uh, same date last year, we actually had a webinar that was actually celebrating women in dairy to engage in case study. We had colleagues from India, New Zealand, and Teto Laval presenting uh, their project. It was very, very inspiring. And you can access actually the video, the slides will be available, and there's a link to the video on our YouTube channel. So I encourage you to have a look. And at that same event, we actually launched our first fact sheet on the role of dairy in nutritional empowerment of women, a very solid base, a science-based document that actually raised all the arguments uh, on that, uh, on the role of dairy. So that's very, very interesting. Uh, secondly, uh, Linda mentioned that we had a first Roman in Dairy Roundtable at the IDF World Dairy Summit in Chicago. Um, and actually, that was very, very interesting. To be honest, that was the highlight of the event for me in Chicago. We had 42 participants, men and women, from 20 countries across the value chain. So we've mixed together farmers and processors and scientists and academic and government people at different tables. Uh, we actually had five tables where we discussed the topic. We had a great keynote, very inspiring, from uh, Chris Arden from Usdeq. Um, and actually, we've exchanged on different topics, uh, and actually, Linda shared with you the uh, the conclusion a bit earlier. But it was actually a very, very, very exciting event, uh, and I, I, I wish you could have been there. We had limited the number of person; it was the first time, so we were a bit tricked by uh, by by the experience. But now we're going to increase a number of people for next time. Um, I want to share with you, actually, at the time of the roundtable, we launched the first woman in dairy uh, report from IDF. And we have a very short video that I want you to listen to because it's very inspiring. So I'm launching it right now.
Uh, two last activities I wanted to mention for 23. Uh, first, the UN uh, Committee on World Food Security was actually working on guidance uh, for gender equality in women and girls in Parliament. So IDF expert Janice Giddens from USDAC uh, contributed to the work of that committee. I must admit it has been a very painful and difficult exercise. It is surprising that still in those days, some countries are opposing recognition of women's right uh, and, and contribution. Uh, so we had a lot of work to do. So thank you, Janice, uh, for doing that. Um, and the last one I wanted to mention in 23, we've had it for the first time, a new category for women empowerment in the dairy sector to our Dairy uh, Innovation Awards. Um, and actually the winner was Shriya Manila Milk Producer Company in India. It's the world's largest only woman owned organization with an office in Tirupati. And they started their work in September 2014. I encourage you to go listen to the video and what they're doing, it's phenomenal. And we had the pleasure to meet with them in Delhi when we had a summit there. It's an incredible work that they are doing. So congratulations to them for the winning. 24, we have a lot of exciting thing coming. Uh, obviously, we have a meeting from the workforce that will, a task force that will be coming. Uh, we also have uh, the webinar today and we're working on a second edition of the Women in Dairy Report. So we'll be calling for your help. If you do have any program uh, that you'd like to share with us, you will have until the end of June to contribute to that second report. Uh, we also continuing the category for women empowerment in the innovation uh, awards. Uh, registration are open uh, until the uh, 1st of June. So if you do have any project, product, exp ex ex any experience you'd like to share in the innovation award, that's a great opportunity. And the winner will be revealed at the IDF World Dairy Summit in Paris. Uh, we actually planning to have a second round table uh, in Paris on October 14. So if you do have an interest, please uh, let us know. So we'll uh, be working by invitation, but please let us know. And today it is my pleasure to actually launch the IDF Woman in Dairy Knowledge Hub. So that's our newest event, uh, actually the newest tool to share the information. So on that platform, you will be finding uh, all kind of reference material, case studies, um, women and all the work we've done at IDF, the fact sheet, the report, the webinars, blogs, uh, and we're actually waiting for your content. So do not hesitate if you have any ideas. Uh, we actually started to do as well, inspir uh, Women Inspiring Women. So we're having interviews with some of the colleagues we have in our network. So if you wish to contribute, please let us know. But that's the kind of content you'll find on the hub. It is actually live right now. Uh, and we're hoping, obviously, that's going to be an ongoing work, but we're going to improve it as we go. And we're wishing uh, that you can help us in, in doing that. Uh, in respect of time, I will go quickly, but I just want to invite you all to join us in Paris for the IDF World Dairy Summit, 15 to 18 of October. That will be an opportunity to continue our conversation on networking and engage, engaging men and women uh, on the Women's and Girls Empowerment. So thank you for this time. And I actually uh, give you the floor uh, to conclude, uh, Judith. Thank you very much, Caroline. And I hope everybody who's on this webinar and who's looking at the webinar uh, in the future, um, if they download the recording, will appreciate that the work of the Women in Dairy Task Force within the IDF has received such a positive response from everybody. It only la uh, was launched last year, and yet the momentum and the connections that have been made are really rich and inspiring. And we want to build on those and leverage all of the work and the great activities and initiatives that people are engaged in around the dairy sector to improve the inclusion of, of women in the future in our work. And we would really love, as Caroline said, for you to share your stories with us. So other than thanking the speakers, which I really do from the bottom of my heart, I would like to ask you all now to turn your camera on because we'd love to take a celebratory photo. Now, the official page for uh, International Women's Day asks that we show a little heart in any photos that we're doing. So if you can give me either a very small little heart or a very big little heart uh, for the recording, that would be fantastic. And then um, Laurels can upload that and we can spread the message. So everybody, 
I'll just give it a second for people who want to turn on their camera to do so. I think most people have turned on their camera. Some people might not want to, but, but for those who are happy to turn on a camera, of course, you don't have to do a heart, but, you know, if you'd like to, go for it. Um, and, uh, yeah, happy International Women's Day to all of you. Thank you very much for participating in the webinar and to all the women in your lives who aren't on this call today. Happy International Women's Day.